morning, friends. Morning. It's another beautiful uh, Sunday morning here. I uh, want to uh, give you a welcome and also to uh, any visitors that we have with us this morning, uh, a special welcome. Uh, please remember to silence your cell phones so that those on uh, Zoom can uh, receive the benefit of better hearing of the uh, program this morning. Last December, uh, Nita and I tuned into uh, the Irish holiday program put on by uh, the PBS station in Boston. We are uh, lovers of all things Irish, especially music. And uh, they closed the program this evening, the uh, MC, with a, a blessing from John O'Donohue, who's a famous Irish author. And uh, just happened that we have that book at home as well. Uh, Anamkara, a book of Celtic wisdom. It actually reminded me, looking at that, uh, hearing that blessing that night, it reminded me of uh, uh, Phil's geezer series and also uh, Mark's message to us last week. So I wanted to share with you a little bit of the text here. It's about uh, the aging process and then close with uh, the blessing this morning. Old age can be a time of clearance. All perception requires clearance. If things are too close to you, you cannot see them. Frequently, that is why we value so little the people who are really close to us. We are unable to step back and behold them with the sense of wonder, critique, and appreciation they deserve. Nor do we behold ourselves either, because we are too close to the rush of our lives. In old age, as your life calms, you will be able to make many clearances in order, to, in order to see who you are, what life has done to you, and what you have made of your life. And here's the blessing that he gave that evening. A blessing for old age. May the light of your soul mind you. May all your worry and anxiousness about becoming old be transfigured. May you be given a wisdom with the eye of your soul to see this beautiful time of harvesting. May you have the commitment to harvest your life, to heal what has hurt you, to allow it to come closer to you and become one with you. May you have great dignity. May you have a sense of how free you are. And above all, may you be given the wonderful gift of meeting the eternal light and beauty that is within you. May you be blessed and may you find a wonderful love in yourself for yourself. Let's take a few minutes to center down. Our first hymn this morning is uh, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee in the Worship and Song Green Book, uh, number 11. Please stand as you are able. Thank you. 
where you go do we sing it the way we sing it or do we sing it the way it's written in the book and that's always a good question especially for hospitality because if you hand people a book and it says one thing and they read music they're going to do one thing and if you don't read music you're going to go okay when is everybody singing so here's where you guys get to decide I didn't ask Lee beforehand I should have I should have asked Joanne I should have asked Phil when do you want to <laughs> And how, do, and how do we tell people? Said, huh? There you go. That's why I didn't. So if you look at that last line, you know, on the first page of the book, of the hymn, it actually has the first note of the last sentence or whatever right there. So what it ha what you have is, if you're, if you're in the first verse, you've, you've sung, Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away, give her all the more. So if you're a Beethoven fan, you know that or in the... Purist. Yes. Or you're following what's printed there. That's how you do it. Right. Right. <laughs> Or if your community sort of agrees on, no, we like to wait a beat because we need a breath. Mm -hmm. Or we need to remember to then take the breath. Be, yeah. Then it would be, melt, yeah, you'd be a, <laughs> drive the dark of doubt away, give her, yeah. So you, so, <clears throat> yes. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. <laughs> so it also depends on which, Hymnal. So which hymnal? And we gave you the green one today, right? Right, because the words are best. Because so the words. Whenever we sing this song from now on, we can say customary way or correct way. Oh, okay, here comes, here comes the music major. Here comes the music major. The music major. <laughs> the question is, do we want to be square or do we want to swing? Anticipated beat? Right. Right. <laughs> let's let's <laughs> shall we you should do do it where you get your breath. So we're gonna well, do, we it can do it. Get, let's do it where we get that breath. Let's try and we should start say, back a bit. Yeah. Start well, yeah. In the first verse. Yeah. We'll do the first. one verse. Okay. We are great. Okay. Teachable moment. We are going to do the first verse. And it's going to be drive the doubt of dark away. <laughs> Okay, I know you purist out there. I'm sorry. No, we. No, we. This is the. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna do this the way that we normally sing it, not the way it's written. First verse. Sing with gusto.
You people are so teachable. I love it. I've spent many years in church in my lifetime, but I think that was my first musical lesson in the middle of the service. So thank you very much, Phil. <laughs> okay, it's time for uh, announcements. Uh, we'll start with our Zoom friends. Anybody up there have an announcement this morning? Hello? Say who it is. This is Bill Smith. I just wanted to make an announcement that on April 21st at 7 p.m., Winborn will be at Fairfield Friends. Try and put it on your calendars. Thank you. Anyone else on Zoom? How about here in the room? Any announcements? Joey? Why, sure. I'm doing this on behalf of outreach. Um, one of our outreach um, entities that we have supported in the past and are looking to support again this year is um, Coco Da. And um, so Jim Mulholland will be coming on March the 12th. That is a couple of Sundays from now. And he will be speaking during chat room and he will talk for about 10 minutes, maybe not that long, during meeting for worship. And what he will be speaking about is the work that Coco Don does, but specifically um, our meeting has um, provided funds for scholarships for um, kids to be able to go on and further their education. So, and is this in Nicaragua? Uh, Central America. Central America, right. Right, so it's a really good cause, is what I'm saying. So mark your calendars for March the 12th during chat room, Jim will be here, and then he will do a, a brief overview again then during meeting for worship. So hope you can make it. Incidentally, this meeting has funded scholarships for 12 students now uh, every year who without us would not be able to go on to high school and, uh, and receive room and board. So thank you for your generosity. And uh, it means the world to these people. It gives them an opportunity they wouldn't otherwise have. So thank you, friends, for your help. Um, quick announcement that, uh, again, hold the day for April 15th. That will be our spring wildflower hike at Brown County State Park. Um, hopefully next weekend I'll have a sign-up sheet ready to go and send out to the meeting so we can get an idea of how many people. But April 15th, Brown County State Park. That was Jeff Gabbert. Please be sure and say your name when you use the mic. Anyone else with an announcement? Okay, it is uh, time for the offering. Thanks to our uh, outreach committee, these offerings support a wide variety of local and global organizations, such as Family Promise, Goodwin Center, The Lord's Pantry, Stability Builders, uh, Kunat Food Pantry, Anna's Celebration of Life, and Coco Da, that Joanne just mentioned. Please place your uh, donations in the collection plates in the back or uh, go online as uh, detailed on our website for uh, different options there. Thank you. Well, I was talking with a young mm. person this week who wants to be a doctor. I said, what are your plans? He said, I want to be a doctor. And I thought, that is such a noble profession. 
And how when you're a doctor, people respect your advice because they know you've studied many, many years and passed a test confirming your expertise. I was talking about this with a doctor friend of mine once, and he said, you know, Phil, you should have gotten an education <laughs> and been a doctor instead of a pastor. I said, well, I, I do have an education. I went to college and graduate school and went on two extra years to study Quakerism and writing. I had to do a two-year internship, and before my degree was conferred, I had to write a thesis and then uh, pass an oral exam with my professors. He said, ah, that's not the same. Anybody can pass a theology test. He said this to me. Now, you know that I'm a pacifist, but I swear to Jesus I wanted to sort the man. According to a recent poll, 20% of Americans now identify, self-identify themselves as Christian nationalists. And here's what that means. They believe God has chosen America to be a Christian nation and that the government should take active steps to keep it that way, including banning books, excluding immigrants of non-Christian faiths, limiting voting. This is actually a thing now. Limiting voting to Christians and even, in some instances, white males. Passing no law unless it is biblical and allowing Christians to possess more rights than non-Christians. This is all to say that not everyone can pass a theology test, or for that matter, a history test. Given our society's theological illiteracy, it's important to know the basic dimensions of our Christian faith. So I'm starting a new series today, uh, and I'm calling it Christianity 101. I had a snarky subtitle, but I took that out. And, um, and I thought, well, if you're going to have Christianity 101, then where do you need to start? And I thought probably a good thing to start with is God. And when we begin to talk about God, one of the first things we have to do is admit right out of the gate that we are at a disadvantage when we talk about God. Because as John the Gospel writer said, no one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. This means that the proper frame of mind when discussing uh, God is humility because, say it with me, no one has ever seen God. You've heard the story of the little girl. She was sitting there at the kitchen table drawing a picture. Her mother came in the room and said, honey, what are you doing? She said, I'm drawing a picture of God. Her mom said, no one knows what God looks like. The little girl looked at her and said, well, they will when I'm finished with my picture. <laughs> if I had drawn a picture of God when I was a kid, it would have been an old man based on two things I had been taught about God. That God was male, you know, he, father, God was male, and that God lived forever. Lived forever. God would have looked just like my neighbor, Mr. Vaughn, a man who by all appearances had been around forever. It helped that Mr. Vaughn was nice and gave me candy when I went to his door. But then Mr. Vaughn died, and when he didn't come back to life three days later, I realized he wasn't God, despite meeting most of the criteria. As it turns out, Mr. Vaughn, while not God, was made in the image of God, as were all of us, which just blows my mind to think about. I don't even know what that means, and I'm not even sure how that works. What does that mean to be made in the image of God? 
We'll be thinking about that and talking about that in this series. I do know that being made in the image of God has caused some people to think they are God. Usually television preachers, certain billionaires, and several members of Congress. We ask ourselves what God is like because this is the big question in life. This is the big question in life. Maybe not the first question. The first question is probably, is there a God? Uh, of course, we have no scientific proof there is, which is fine because asking, is there a God, does God exist, is really not a question for science. It really isn't. What we have, though, you and I, are moments and experiences of transcendence, times when we feel deeply loved and known by a spirit beyond ourselves, an encounter unlike any other encounter we experience in our lives. These encounters, we know from talking with other people, transcend cultures and religions and are so significant, so uh, real to us, so important to us that we just can't casually dismiss them. We can't say, well, I had a little too much to drink. Uh, they're very real things to us that happen to us in moments of real sanity. Um, our shorthand word for that experience is God, which raises the second question then. Well, if there is a God, what is God like? What is God like? And our answer to that question influences our behavior deeply and always. If we believe God is an all-knowing, all-powerful ruler who must be obeyed, then you and I will be slaves. Stripped of freedom, treated with contempt because we are lesser, groveling to a tyrant in the sky who demands our conformity or else. In my experience, a good many people who believe in God believe in that kind of God. I have never experienced that God. Indeed, if that is who God is, then I want it to go on the record right now as saying uh, that I am an atheist. Having no interest in loving or following a celestial Hitler. It has also been my experience that those who believe in that kind of God, having made their peace with tyranny, are more likely to tyrannize others, believing it their sacred duty, hence the Christian nationalism, whose God uh, is never merciful, and if it is present, that mercy is always confined to a tribe or a nation or a religion. This is the God of fundamentalists everywhere. It is the God of closed minds, hardened hearts, and militant ignorance. It is the God of those who turn hate into law. Wherever and whenever people are reviled and rejected, there this God is found. When this God finally dies, when it can no longer find lodging in any human heart, the world will be a far lovelier place. I have not seen God, but I have enjoyed moments of deep and profound joy. I have enjoyed moments of clarity when my path and duty became clear to me. I have enjoyed moments of forgiveness and acceptance when self-hating 
Hatred threatened to overwhelm me. I have enjoyed moments of reconciliation when my anger and hatred gave way to compassion and understanding. I have enjoyed moments of insight when wisdom beyond my customary capacity helped me know things I would not otherwise have known. I have enjoyed moments of love when I have been entirely consumed, overwhelmed with affection for others. Throughout my life, I have heard other people say the same. So believe the experiences I've described are not unique to me, but are common to all people, transcending religion, culture, and race. I believe these experiences are rooted in a spirit within us all, which I call God. This spirit calls us to love when it is easier to hate, calls us to share when it is tempting to accumulate, calls us to embrace when we would rather shake the fist calls us to listen when we are tempted to rant and correct, calls us to create, to create when we are inclined to destroy, to be made in the image of God is to aspire always, always to be the best person we can be, the finest self we can be. And two, when the day is done, lie down in peace. Our hearts full, our conscience untroubled, knowing we are both loved and called to love. That to me is God and there is no place in that definition that permits me to treat others poorly there is no place in that definition that permits me to extend some rights to others and exclude others from the rights I enjoy There is no place in that God that allows me to be happy at someone else's suffering or to be gleeful when someone with whom I have trouble is suffering. There is no place in our lives and in that understanding of God that allows for that. And when at the end of every day I can lie down in bed with my heart full and my conscience untroubled, knowing I am loved and knowing I am called to love, I know that that is a day I have spent in God's presence. That to me is God in whom we love and live and move and have our being. Uh, just for a little background, I'm, uh, I'm Paula, and Rex is going to get tired of hearing this. But <laughs> um, for most of my life, I've been trying to um, find some way of experiencing God and expressing that. I was raised Lutheran. I went to a Lutheran teacher's college. I taught in a Lutheran school. Um, and I learned the catechism, but I, that, I didn't really find God there. Uh, for a few years, I attended a Southern Baptist church. I loved a lot of the experiences there, but I didn't have that born-again experience everybody was talking about. And uh, now, 
in my 70s, I have finally found an expression of what I, the best I can do. Open to divine, no, better not. Open to transcendent goodness, reflecting it in my life. And you notice I'm not doing anything, it's all passive. I'm tired of trying to do and find and believe and research. I'm just, I just want to be open to whatever happens and I want to express whatever goodness comes to me in the way I live. Friends, let us stand and sing our last song, hymn number 240 in the green hymnal, The Lone Wild Bird. Cynthia, can you play this through once for us? Thank you, friend. song. Thank you, Cynthia, for playing the piano for us this morning. Our usual pianist, Lee Edmondson, had a medical procedure this week and can no longer use his right arm for a period of several weeks. And so Cynthia stepped in. I was going to make up a big story about Lee damaging his right arm while saving a little child from railroad tracks, but I thought, no, I won't do that. I'll just come right out and say it. Well, I have a good friend who's become a friend through motorcycling. He doesn't come to church, uh, which is fine. Uh, he always says he can't believe that he spends time with a minister. He never dreamed he would. Uh, I was with him the other day, and we were talking about Donald Trump. Now, you know, over the course of the Trump presidency, I have made it a careful point to never say anything at all about that and to keep my counsel to myself. You know, I have been that way. And so yesterday, in violation of that pattern, I was talking about Donald Trump and said to this man, my motorcycle friend who doesn't go to church, I won't be happy until that man is in prison. And he said, really? He said, that's interesting. I thought you would have been happy if you he were healed. And you know what I told him? 
I said, look, buddy, I studied theology for 10 years. I know what I mean. So let's never, friends, do what I did. Let us never be glad at the idea of revenge and retribution to satisfy some twisted longing in ourselves. Let us instead always work and pray and labor for the healing not only of ourselves, but for the healing of all. This is what it means to be a Christian. May we be that way. Turn and greet, friends.